Welcome. I'm Jessica Rye, Director of Communications for United Launch Alliance. Thank you for joining us today. We have a wonderful announcement and partnership to talk with you about today, and so we're going to get right to the conversation, and then we'll do some Q&A. So I'd like to introduce Mr. Robert Bigelow, founder and president of Bigelow Airspace. Yeah, this is this is a uh, a propitious occasion, as they say, I guess, <laughs> and we're really happy to be uh, being able to uh, announce uh, a potentially enormously important relationship. So I want to first exp express my thanks to all of you attending here, and especially to ULA. And uh, this is a great place to have this uh, press conference uh, at the Broadmoor, so it's really appropriate. And um, I understand that you have all received a press release uh, essentially describing some of the basic uh, uh, areas of this uh, uh, r relationship, if I'm not mistaken. I believe you've all received that, so I won't get, get into specific details about the size of the B-330 or, or those kinds of things, so you understand that, that uh, there, there is a collaborative effort here to do a number of things, especially in the last paragraph of that second page. It said a lot, you know, it was a very important area in there. So um, I, I, one of the things I want to do is characterize a little bit this new space era, take a, a couple minutes, which I, my perception is that it really began in 2011 when, the, uh, when there was a, the cessation of the flying of the shuttle because NASA was on an irreversible course at that point in time to, to uh, <clears throat> go forward and to have a dependency on the commercial sector. And of course there are at least four companies uh, that uh, have a lot of promise in being able to, to uh, perfect their taxi system. And my, so <clears throat> from a small company perspective like, like us, that we, you know, we're focused on the destination, we are totally dependent on the, ta the availability of, of transportation for crew and cargo to and from any of these destinations. So <clears throat> in our perspective, we look at this decade of, of the new space era being from 2011 to maybe 2021, and what is it that can happen in those 10 years? We have um, uh, put forth the effort in our company to try to achieve uh, uh, two full-scale 330s that will be completed and ready for deployment uh, and, and be able to be shipped out of Las Vegas in the latter part of 2019 and the very early part of 2020, so they could both be deployed in 2020. And so I, I had prepared a couple of little notes here, uh, and then I'll, I'll talk briefly about uh, something else. So, so to us, this represents a first phase, this 10 years from 2011 to 2021, that's really pretty darn important. Uh, in this new space era, this NSC will be defined by the really serious emergence of space commercialization, obviously aside from the satellite communication, and several different new dynamics. For the first time, stations and transportation systems will be available to serve as an open resource. <clears throat> That's a big deal, as an open resource, and not mainly the purview of, of nations. Um, the majority of Earth's nations and corporations couldn't, can have access, and that, that's a big deal. So as a result of affordability and access, new products and everything that affect human health, entertainment, national security, and other areas will be marketed. <clears throat> These new industries will help pay for the future pursuit of eventually lunar enterprises, which will characterize <clears throat> phase two. And in, and in our world of thinking, that's from 21 to 31, 2021 to 2031 <clears throat> of the new space era. <clears throat> NASA is evolving from <clears throat> essentially owning everything to being a, co a commercial customer and a tenant. Excuse me. <clears throat> By the end <clears throat> of phase one in 2021, <clears throat> there will be <clears throat> more than a single company able to transport crew and cargo. And then we begin the phase two of things. <clears throat> phase two is characterized by more LEO stations, more destinations, <clears throat> multiple taxi services that are <clears throat> reliable, efficient, and affordable. 
and probably a 20-fold increase in the amount of astronauts that are actually working. I, I believe NASA, <coughs> excuse me, currently only has maybe a population of about 40 active astronauts, if I'm not mistaken, and that <coughs> about um, probably represents a similar number for a global amount of astronauts, at least in, in maybe a, uh, setting aside China. But uh, so we, you know, saying that there's going to be a 10 or 20 fold increase is a substantial number of folks. And we think that that's a function of having more destinations and having at least several of these uh, new transportation companies be successful. Uh, I know <clears throat> most of those folks pretty well, and um, I think there is really a good chance for, for uh, four companies to be uh, active and, uh, in serving uh, low Earth orbit needs. Um, so <clears throat> we're pretty excited about this. We are uh, looking to, uh, if, we have, if we have eventually permission and we're trying to acquire permission from NASA to be able to locate a, a B-330 on station, if we're able to, to do that and, and have X-Base be there, <clears throat> we are asking also that we be given consideration to being able to commercialize time and volume. <clears throat> and this is no different than if you have an office building, you have a 30-story office building, and uh, you're trying to lease uh, a number of floors. Maybe the, a bank is the anchor tenant. Maybe, <clears throat> maybe NASA is an anchor tenant. And you have other people. <clears throat> My voice is failing me here. And uh, you have other people that are also lessees. But it also means, <clears throat> you know, there's, a, there's an opportunity, perhaps, for branding and naming. So who's, whose name is going to be on the building? <clears throat> and, and usually it's the, it's the anchor tenant. And our model here <clears throat> is to try to avoid people having to write checks for any larger amounts than they absolutely have to. That's the objective. In order to increase the population of users and, and what it gets, gets down even to the individual. So, uh, and we can talk more about that uh, in terms of concept, but it's the same concept if you were doing a university naming of lecture halls and wings of a building, the building itself, and finally this whole, the whole college, the whole school. You know, that college could be named after somebody, and that's, that's a, a universal way of raising money and acknowledging people, and so on and so forth. And, uh, um, you know, there's that huge AT&T football stadium down in Dallas. And they play, paid a huge fortune for a magnificent facility there. And it's, and it's really well worth it, you know, for AT&T to have that exposure. Uh, we would love to see uh, Disney have a Disney space station. Uh, wouldn't that be cool? I don't know how many of you here, <clears throat> I'm looking at the age of the audience here, and uh, gee whiz, it seems a whole lot younger than, than where I am. But I can remember when I was about 14, Walt Disney had his Disney uh, show, and he had the Werner Von Braun on that show several times, several times. And they had Werner Von Braun's rocket there, which was a huge rocket, and they had the big wheel, you know, the AG, the artificial gravity wheel that they talked about. And Walt was a heck of a space fan. He really was. He, he, if, had he, I think he had lived longer, he would have been into space some way or another, probably in some kind of a substantial, substantial capacity. So I would love to see a company like that, like that uh, be the vanguard of future stations and operations. <clears throat> so uh, having said that, um, and I'm, my, my voice is acting up here, I'm going to go ahead and take my seat and uh, turn things over back over to Jessica. So thank you very much for your comments, sir. And now I'd like to introduce Mr. Tori Bruno, ULA President and CEO. Well, good afternoon. Thank you for coming out. I could not be more excited to stand up here and talk about this partnership with Bob and with Bigelow Aerospace. You know, we are standing on the very threshold of an expanded and permanent human presence beyond our planet. In the beachhead for that future, the foundation will be the commercialization of LEO. And Bob's innovative technology is really the key that's going to unlock that future. This is so exciting. This is going to greatly expand the opportunities for research, for manufacturing, and yes, for space tourism in LEO. We're really talking about the democratization of space, where it will no longer be the sole domain 
of highly trained and highly skilled and elite astronauts, but a place where people like you and I, where, where normal, regular men and women go to, to live and work. And so this is very, very exciting to me, and I am thrilled to be able to announce this partnership and to be able to help Bob by build, you know, helping to create this transportation highway to the destinations that he is creating. This is a very bright future, and you and I right now are standing here looking right into it. And so with that, I think we're available to take questions. So yes, please wait for the microphone and state your name and affiliation. We're going to start in the room. We do have some questions online as well. So we'll start here in the front. Hi, Jeff House of Space News for uh, either Mr. Bruno or Mr. Bigelow. Um, could you elaborate a little bit on exactly what this partnership entails? Is there a launch contract signed here? Is there a letter of intent for a launch? What, uh, what are the terms of the partnership that's being announced today? So this is a, uh, a work in process. Um, we, we, uh, we do have a, uh, an agreement on something that, that uh, would be uh, typical when you are doing the really early preliminary uh, work in terms of characterization of a payload. But uh, this is very much a work in process in terms of the overall concept and the overall picture uh, by all means. So we have a lot of work ahead of us. And uh, we, we are intend to work together. And as the, as the press briefing said, you know, that last paragraph on that second page, as I alluded to, uh, really uh, says it all in, in terms of, of what we're trying to do to, together. I, I think that you said it. Hi, uh, Chris Davenport from the Washington Post. When you say here that this is the first ever commercial partnership between a launch provider and a habitat provider, you're talking about where NASA is sort of out of the loop, where, I mean, SpaceX just launched your habitat. Um, can you talk a little bit about the significance of that, where you have companies partnering with companies without a government sort of in the loop there? Sure. So it, it's what I was referring to a moment ago, where we're seeing private companies look to commercialize LEO. You know, NASA has done the tremendous exploration work, and they've sort of, you know, blazed that trail. And I think as they look to their future, they talk about pushing further into deep space and counting on industry, on commercial companies, to really capitalize and exploit all of that wonderful work that they've done to commercialize LEO. And so we are getting together as private companies to actually, you know, to actually see that vision happen. Chris, nice to put a face to the name. Um, we have uh, several folks right now that would like to fly things on beam. Uh, we, have, uh, uh, we have countries and we have corporations. Uh, we didn't <coughs> really try to promote that. Be, and and uh, beam is more awkward to accommodate uh, commercial payloads, as you might imagine, than a 330 would be. And yet, uh, surprisingly, um, <clears throat> the notion has been preliminarily vetted uh, with NASA. And so we're getting some cautionary nods. And I'm hopeful that perhaps in six months or, or so, uh, we may be able to accommodate these folks who, who want to do that. And that would be really exciting, because that would be the proof <clears throat> that, that there are people that are interested that even in a in, even in a, a very uh, minimal kind of context, being able to uh, be you know be able to fly certain kinds of payloads and and that uh, so it'd be under much more of a hardship by far, ten times more of a hardship by far than if they had the 330 to work with and they had uh, their own crew or their own their own people on board as payload specialists. Yeah, you know, I, I just want to say that. You know, Bob's vision that he described before when he was at the podium and here for the business model that you have in mind for the B-330 is the thing that I think is the most exciting about it. This is a very innovative idea and it's one that is really new to aerospace and certainly new to space itself. So, you know, this is innovation, the real thing. Go here and then back to the second row. 
gentleman, Tom Roeder with the Gazette. One thing that fascinates me about this relationship is you have the innovative, young entrepreneurial company g getting with the, the very established, very buttoned down company. How do you manage the cultures and how do you balance the, the tolerance of risk between the two firms? So can, can I, if I loosen my time, will that, will that help? <laughs> well, he didn't notice my age. I mean, I, I, if, you know, I'm old enough to be characterized as an older part in this, in this relationship, right? <laughs> so, but bless you for not uh, bringing that to anybody's attention. <laughs> well, you know, I, I always think that good partnerships are, are ones where both parties bring something to the table. You know, so if we're going to have commercial destinations in space, we have to have a place to go where meaningful activities happen, and we have to have a place, you know, a way to get there and come back. Bob is providing the destination. We have a great track record on going to and from. We have a very capable and powerful fleet of rockets. And when we're talking about people and the frequency that, that this vision embodies, you know, I think our, our record is going to be something that's pretty, pretty valuable and a big enabler. You know, in, in the lift industry, people, uh, you know, sort of accept in non-human flight, you know, one failure in 20, even one failure in 10. And the team that I'm privileged to lead and very proud of has achieved zero failures in 106. And so you need reliable transportation to make this work, and we're bringing that to the partnership. And by the way, that is an amazing crap. That B-330 is bigger than my first apartment. <laughs> uh, Rand Simberg, Interglobal Media. Uh, Bob, have you, have your clients expressed an interest in a location? Will these be co-orbital with each other? Will they be co-orbital with ISS? Will they, they be somewhere else? Or is that TBD? It, it's sort of a TBD. We're, we are a, a little biased toward having this, uh, this first 330 on station. And so we call it uh, X base, in a sense, uh, because it, uh, it will provide NASA with the terrific opportunity to have a testing station on station that is really a formidable size. It represents 30 percent of the existing volume of the station. So how would you be comfortable in, in uh, outfitting uh, new ecos technologies and other kinds of systems uh, when you're a long ways from mama, you're a long ways from home, if you didn't test it, test everything out and every which way you could, close to home first. <coughs> So we, we are hoping that we can get the kind of permissions uh, that are necessary from NASA to say, yes, <clears throat> let's go ahead and attach that to station, and we can try to execute that docking and everything that's required and, uh, <clears throat> and have that be a, a super testing station platform, the B-330. Hi, it's Frank Mooring with Aviation Week. I was a little bit late, but... Um, Mr. Bigelow, could, could you tell what work needs to be done to the, the 330 before it's ready to attach to the station? What do you have to do to it? And then to continue that same line of questioning, where are you in your development of a free-flying 330? Okay, so <clears throat> our forte is structures. We know uh, a, quite a bit, I would probably say a lot, about expandable systems and the metallic interfaces to those systems, and we have been working on these for 15 years. We have flown Genesis 1 and 2 in 06 and 07. Um, and so, and we haven't stopped testing. We haven't stopped innovating. Uh, I'm a stickler for the, the, the constant regime of testing and, and more than just ample margins. And you'll ask anybody in the, in the company and they will shake their head, oh yeah. Um, so we have, a, we have a testing regime going on that's extensive this year and next year. We are also developing full-scale uh, development units. We uh, did the 100A, which was a full-scale um, skeletal structure of all the metallics. We're doing a 100B. We will probably fully populate that in another uh, six, eight months. And then we will segue into the 200 uh, series, the DS-200 series, which is a flight-like, full-scale flight-like unit. <coughs> and then we will migrate into the the 300 series, which is a engineering unit, and it's, it'll be part of the qual. So, um, and we go through the same kind of, of 
uh, efforts with the soft goods as well. Uh, we do more HVI testing, hypervelocity impact testing. We're going to be doing all kinds of control testing on expansions. We do things that, to destruction. We do long-term duration uh, testing, leak testing, and so on. So um, if, if this turns out to be located on the ISS, what we have to be conscious of is cohabitating some of our systems with NASA's systems. And NASA may say, well, <clears throat> we prefer, we, we don't like the toilet arrangement that you guys have. We, we are working on one of our own, which is true right now. <clears throat> They'd like to segue away from the Russian uh, having uh, the fame and glory on that. Um, but uh, so we are having to provide duality. On board, we have enough room to where you could run simultaneously two dissimilar systems if you wanted to. So you could have a very experimental system on there that holds a lot of promise for deep space use and not have your, all your eggs in that basket. Amen, yes. I was just using that as a, as a flippant example, which actually is a pretty serious thing. Jen DiMassio with Aviation Week. Um, what kind of permissions are necessary from NASA? What do you have to get in place? <clears throat> it, it's going to go through the, the process of internal authorities that are required uh, within the NASA hierarchy. Uh, it is going to also, uh, they have to consider the partners, the station partners. They're, the, you know, we experienced this in, with BEAM, that uh, we had to recognize that that location is about the most sensitive location in space that there is. So even with BEAM, we had to be concerned about perturbations to the entire structure on its expansion, you know, so and NASA was super, super, super cautious about those kinds of things. So this is no small matter of, of consideration. We're going to have to go through a gauntlet of challenges to be able to achieve that structure being located on station. If it were a free flyer, that, that we we avoid all those kinds of things, but uh, it, if it can be achieved on station, NASA maximizes the utility of uh, its staff <coughs> that is already on station. It may also be a, in a facility <coughs> that its partners are going to get excited about because we think <coughs> this will add life beyond 2024 to the ISS. And there are a lot of folks who do not want to see the ISS go into the drink and feel that, gee, uh, why can't we just add on to this structure and continue the viability of such an expensive uh, investment that the Americans have already made, $100 billion. Hi, yeah, James Drew with Flight Global. Um, so who is going to pay for uh, this launch when it happens? Um, are you looking for NASA to sponsor it or some other agency to sponsor it or a bunch of entrepreneurs to sponsor it? How, how are we going to fund uh, the ULA Atlas V launch? So that depends on how, how this all works out between now and then. So as Bob said, we are exploring how to accomplish this. Clearly, if there were a NASA-centric mission and NASA wanted to invest in lifting the B-330, I would be pleased to work with them. But I think there's other opportunities as well. Such as? I'll let Bob. I'll let you talk. You're so nosy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is tough to talk about because, you know, we're ex we would love to say a lot of things we shouldn't, all right? And, it, and it's not appropriate that we talk about too much in details because we are getting ahead of ourselves. We need to cement certain things, even though we have a lot of concepts that are really cool, really exciting, and can do NASA a hell of a favor. Uh, it's premature to talk in specifics about these kinds of things. Um, I guess my, I'm Bill Young with African American Voice, and um, I guess my question is around security and safety issues as a, a private industry. Uh, um, having the two of you team up without a government, how are you going to resolve those issues, and are they going to be open source so that other companies can kind of be on the same page with you guys when it comes time for them to do similar things? Okay. 
I am smiling because you were never around our shop uh, when we were fabricating the beam. <clears throat> NASA was there a lot, and we had a serious uh, amount of uh, insight opportunity. We provided insight <clears throat> with NASA in far as the the construction, development, fabrication of the beam was concerned, as opposed to oversight. There's a little bit of a difference there. And so it wasn't, it wasn't as though we were turned loose by any stretch of the imagination. And that's not going to be the case with the 330 either. If it's going to station, NASA's going to be all over that structure. I guarantee it. Yeah. So I'll, just add, I'll just add to that a little bit. Um, you know, safety and reliability is core discipline for us. It's core skills. We take it very, very seriously. And one of our core principles is transparency with our customers. And, and I'll also share that, that in our industry, when it comes to safety and people's lives, that uh, there has always been a tradition of cooperation, even between private companies, you know, separate from any government requirements, because some things transcend that. Thanks. One of the questions from social media on Twitter from at Chuck O. Garcia in regards to uh, bringing people and expanding the astronauts that are in space is what will be the professions of the first 50 off-world jobs um, we see supported by CIS Lunar 1000? Oh, do you wanna, the 50 on jobs? What? So the first 50 jobs that exist off our planet, the first 50 commercial people who are up there, <coughs> what do you think they'll be doing mm. <coughs> All right, so from, uh, you're going to be driving that from a business perspective. Um, you know, usually you are, you are coming up and creating the ways that you have something to market. So exploration is important. You have to check out what is it that's there. But before you've done that, you have to navigate through the legal regime of being able to, to <clears throat> secure assets that you find. And if, if you find in situ assets that you're going to harvest, you're going to transport those someplace, you have to have that permission. We think that kind of permission is, is not blockaded by the 67 Space Treaty. We think it's in harmony with that. Uh, so you're, you're going to have to be locating where there are resources that you can market. In our particular case, our company would like to be the kind of Hudson Bay sort of company. We would like to have the facilities to accommodate people and whatever enterprises is there, if they're mining, if they're exploring for this or that, if we're hosting a country, another nation to explore, uh, then that's what we would like to be able to do is facilitate those kinds of folks rather than to initiate those kinds of activities ourselves. If, they, if there were people putting together power systems or transportation systems, whatever it might be, maybe a rail system of some sort, who knows, or even a launch facility. We would try to accommodate those kinds of folks any way we could, but we actually would leave it up to the professionals in those industries to do that kind of work. So I absolutely agree with everything that Bob said. And you know, the funnest part about this type of endeavor is that we just don't know. And so I'll speculate too. I'm going to speculate that the first jobs, the first commercial jobs in space are commercial research corporate-related or corporate-sponsored space research, and perhaps zero-G manufacturing, and then extending out into prospecting and in the development of, of resources that are just a week, week and a half's journey from where we're sitting here. Such abundance that it defies human imagination. But that's what I think, and it's going to be so much fun to find out together. Okay, we'll go back to questions in the room. Hi, uh, Miriam Kramer with Mashable. Uh, I am just sort of curious. So, if this were, if the B330 were to attach to the space station, uh, would you expect that NASA would be your customer for that particular uh, module, or would you expect to be able to have other industry partners or other nations? I'm not totally sure how that would work, but yeah. Our hope is uh, that NASA would be the primary uh, customer for that. Uh, that structure and that we would be given permission to commercialize and essentially we, we're, we would be time sharing. Okay, <clears throat> so what we're doing is we're offering uh, discrete uh, quantities of time, a matter of, of uh, one or two weeks to maybe 45 days um, to various kinds of clientele 
and also certain areas on board the spacecraft that we have permission for those that clientele to locate packages and experiments that they that they uh, that was the motivation for them to be there. We can take another question from social media and then I'll And how is it exciting I'm sorry. But time share in space. Come on. <laughs> another question from Twitter at Nelson Bridwell is how many B three thirties will we see in orbit in the next five to ten years? So if we have the wherewithal to set up the production facility <clears throat> to create two for launch in 2020, um, we're not about to shut that down. Now, we're uh, light years from being Boeing, so we're not going to be able to produce a 737 in a day, right? Less than a day, actually. So, <clears throat> so we, it will take time to create these structures, but as we do, we'll be able to do that more quickly. So I think uh, by, say, you said 2025 or 6, I, don't, I forget the time, time frame on that. The next five years. Five years after the 2020. Okay. <clears throat> so that, that's going to be um, probably a function of are we able to find enough good staff to be able to, to put these structures together in that kind of quantity. That's really, really important, the people. Because this is really all about, a lot about the technicians and the people that put these systems together. So that's a big deal. Um, you know, the fan financial wherewithal means something. The facilities themselves mean something. Our plant is pretty large, and I built it to accommodate a flow of, of structures that could be in tandem. So I, I think we could expect uh, uh, possibly to be able to populate several different destinations uh, in addition to the ISS. Hi, I'm Tom Sjogren from Explorers Web. So after working with this for the last 15 years or even longer, um, are you still bound to the um, soft structures, inflatable structures, or would you be willing to work with rigid structures as well? Or could you expand on the, um, how you feel about the two differences today? Until we get to a, uh, a way of lifting w large, heavy structures <clears throat> that um, is completely different than today. You're almost, we're almost talking levitation. Unless there is an enormous breakthrough in being able to deploy something from the surface of the Earth to a substantial altitude, there is no way that rigid systems can, can out overcome the advantages of expandable systems. There is just no way they can. And you can, you can look at it almost any different way that you want. And especially if the rigid system, now you could have you may not have the, the uh, mal-effect of radiation on human tissue inside composite systems like you do aluminum systems, but uh, it's disastrous with aluminum systems. And, and again, your confinement to that structure, because as good as it's going to get, is what the size was in that fairing upon deployment, upon launch, and that was what you got on, on deployment, and that basically is it. You could have certain articulation of different things, but in terms of overall volume, it's going to be the same. And that's the beauty of expandable systems, is it's not the same. There's no relationship at all as to what you started out with in the size of what it's going to be at that, uh, when it's deployed. Yeah, you know, from the perspective of the lift person, <laughs> the expandable structure is the innovation that is making this possible. That's the breakthrough. Because all space structures that go up have to fit underneath the rocket's payload fairing. And physics dictate a limitation to that, and it dictates a certain set of economies around how big we make those. And so with that model of lift, this is really the way to go. This is from at angry B8. Uh, for Mr. Bruno, are you investigating using an ACES upper stage to transfer people or cargo between these different space stations? Sure. Our long-range vision carries us to the to the Vulcan ACES launch vehicle. And for those of you who are not familiar with ACES, that's our next generation second stage that will replace the Centaur. It's a much larger stage with much greater capability. 
It can operate for a, an extraordinarily long period of time. Centaur today is the longest operating upper stage in the world. It operates for seven to eight hours. This new ASA stage will go for seven or eight days. And it will be refuelable and therefore fully reusable, something that no one has contemplated, a reusable upper stage. And a breakthrough idea there is that you don't have to bring it to Earth in order to reuse it. And so, yes, our concept is to eventually see a fleet of these ACES upper stages, essentially space trucks, carrying cargo and, and ferrying things between destinations in, in LEO and in cislunar space. Just one more question for Mr. Bigelow on the what it would take to attach the B-330 to the space station. Can you use the same berthing mechanism and expansion mechanisms that you're using on beam on the space on the larger module? Is is there heritage there that you can use? Or are you going to have to um, develop some new stuff? And also, you, you talked a lot about testing. How much of a testing? How long in terms of months, years? of a testing program do you see for the larger module? So in the, in the uh, docking or berthing process, <clears throat> there, are, there are two alternatives at least. One is to actually try using the Canada arm and berth <clears throat> the 330. That's a potential possibility. And the other is where we come, under, uh, come in under our own power. And <clears throat> as, as far as to the particulars of the docking mechanism, uh, I, I would guess that we're, there, those would have to be enhanced because we're dealing with different mass uh, levels than we are with the, with the beam. So the 330 is, is 20 times the volume, and um, our, our view right now is that that would r come in at around 43,500 pounds. And I have to apologize. I forget the second part of your question. Your test program for to we, be ready to birth? We, uh, we never stop testing. But when will you be ready? We will be, we will be ready in, in terms of uh, by, by 2020, we will have two vehicles ready for deployment and, and as far as this whole testing regime is, is, is concerned. But beyond that, we're going to be continuing to test. We test other kinds of things that we innovate. So we, we essentially don't stop on our testing. And, and will not stop on our innovation. Hi, my name is Sloan Trugman from Aminet Insights. Um, a lot of startups have a social component or a giving back, uh, a mission. Is there anything in this partnership that we can see towards education, giving back to the community within this expansion? And is there anything that you're thinking about within space for the new job economy that you're giving into it? somebody uh, be a sponsor of that with us and it might be a process to where we you know you're aware of the uh, space camps Huntsville has a huge space camp and it's really popular and a lot of fun well what if <clears throat> there were a substantial program to process kids through the ambition of eventually being an astronaut and uh, once they have gone through a, a, uh, a long process, uh, lasting years, they have to be over 21 years of age for, for contractual reasons and, you know, for responsibility, legal responsibility reasons. But what if it were actually possible <clears throat> to have a really large pool of young folks who aspired to be astronauts who might be able to fly for free and maybe once a year one of them is chosen to be an associate astronaut. And they're going to be put to work when they're on board. They're not just there looking out the windows. They're actually going to have a responsible duties and responsible positions of, of, of uh, having to have obligations. But that would be one way we can give back, is having some kind of program like that. And, um, you know, and, I, and I can think of a couple different companies 
that might be interested in that where they already are dealing <clears throat> with maybe through the entertainment industry they're dealing with millions and millions of young people to start with so it seems like gee why not let's kick it up a notch and raise it to something like that so I'm a huge supporter of STEM. That's a great question. So three things. Uh, the first is we announced not too long ago a program where we're going to put a standard CubeSat carrier on every upper stage. This is no different. And that program will have free rides for STEM on every mission, in addition to the rides that are sold to other people. So we'll, this is no different. That's a part of our standard offering beginning just before this time frame. I will be looking for other opportunities to do exactly what you have asked about. But if we step back for a moment, let's take a look at the big picture. This project is allowing humanity to step off of this planet in a sustained and permanent way. I cannot think of a more important and a more impactful giving to humanity than that one. Is that how you would define democratizing space? So when I talked about democratizing space, that was a part of it. The other part of it is, is what we talked about when we said it will be something that involves many people, ordinary people, people who go to space because there's jobs in space, because they can go to space to have a better life. Take one more question from social media. This is actually from Irene Klotz with Reuters Online. She asked, does this partnership entail any financial support by ULA to Bigelow Aerospace? So we're collaborating together with resources of technology and talent and exploring the future, as Bob explained to that earlier question and when he was at the podium. We don't talk about dollars in investment. Um, and so, you know, you'll see as time goes by what this fully encompasses. Simberg, Global Media. This is another technical question as a follow-up to my first one because I hadn't realized you are going to attach uh, two parts. One, I assume you are going to birth, not dock, so we have more, you know, bigger access. And the other is there are different requirements for a free flyer than an attached system. So are you going to have, and, and if it's attached, will you have RCS, will you have thermal control, will you have power, or will you just get those from the station and have a different version as a free flyer? So one of the concepts is that um, if it's attached to station, it may be there for a period of time that could last some years, uh, or it might be uh, uh, released from station and another habitat combined with it. From Marcia Smith at Space Policy Online, can the B-330s that will be ready in 2020 operate independently of the ISS if NASA says no, or do they need ISS life support? No, the B-330s are designed to be uh, an autonomous operation, and they are a, uh, a space station. Each one is able to be its own space station. They need no other habitats, modules, or anything of the sort. They have their own propulsion systems, ECLIS, avionics, etc., and they, they are uh, an autonomous station, albeit a lot smaller than 1,100 cubic meters, but they are still large. They're, th they're 330 cubic meters each. So it only takes about three of those to equal the entire volume almost of the ISS. Jeff of Space News, follow up on that previous question then. Um, since the B-330s can operate autonomously, um, why not fly them autonomously and not deal with the technical and policy challenges of trying to integrate them to the space station? That is really attractive, believe me. However, <clears throat> that isn't in the best interest of NASA. If NASA is going to, I mean, even if they were to fly at 28.1 you know, degrees, uh, and, and you have better access that way. <clears throat> Naturally, there, there are advantages. But the station offers uh, probably the best choice in, in, of the two all, uh, choices, and uh, that way <clears throat> NASA can have more of a seamless operation, if you will, uh, by having X-Base on station 
and <clears throat> they don't, they're not compelled to have to increase the size of their crew. They're not compelled to, um, you know, we, we, we want to create more taxi traffic to and from because of commercial opportunities. So there would be more commercial traffic. But from NASA's perspective and saving money, it may not be that necessary to increase, uh, certainly would not necessarily substantially to increase the amount of traffic to the station uh, because of the, of the 330 being there. They may want to haul up uh, special kinds of hardware on occasion in addition to uh, resupplying consumables for the astronauts and, and of course there are always a menu of spare parts and consumables and other things, experiments and so forth that, that NASA is flying. But it does make a lot of logistical sense for this X base to be on station. Do we have any additional questions in the room? Greg? Hi, Greg Avery with the Denver Business Journal. Um, I'm curious, have you, uh, could you name the four taxi providers that you envision being available to, to take? And then have you had any meaningful um, partnership discussions with those four at this point? We look at uh, Jeff Bezos uh, with, with uh, Blue Origin, uh, potentially. Uh, we look at uh, the SNC with uh, Dream Chaser, a Sierra Nevada Corporation. And we look at uh, Boeing's with a CST-100. And we look at SpaceX with a dragon. And yes, we, we do know those folks. Uh, James Drew again with Fly Global. Um, and so this, would this be an exclusive partnership with you with LA, uh, ULA? Or are you open to any sort of launch provider who wants to uh, get compatibility with, with, to launch your uh, expandable habitats? Well, ULA provides a unique situation. They have the, uh, the only launch vehicle with the appropriate fairing size that can accommodate our 330. In the future? Well, in, in, in the future, <clears throat> we like, our, our policy and our habit has been to maintain relationships for long periods of time. <clears throat> we don't like just short-term relationships and, and we're not flippant about relationships. So uh, my own personal philosophy is to, is to maintain relationships for a long period of time. And would you not have a relationship with SpaceX? Uh, with SpaceX, they, they do not have the capability uh, with the fairing size uh, that's necessary to accommodate the 330, so that's not even a, a choice. You know. Question from Sergio? To follow up on the the kind of long-term relationship from at DIY Gary. What is the overall goal of this partnership between ULA and Bigelow Aerospace and what steps are you looking to take to get there? You mean other than trying to make a hell of a lot of money? <laughs> I think that there are a lot of challenges here and when you're trying to do something really novel like this it isn't simple. Uh, the, the odds are, are, are huge. It's going to be a struggle. There are a lot of chefs in the kitchen, and that always makes it tough. There are a lot of people to try to satisfy. Uh, and so this is not going to be any kind of a simple uh, situation. And we're going into this with, with a philosophy that we're going to have to work together and, uh, and, and develop the satisfaction within NASA and the, the uh, international partners. And, um, and then I'll, I think also the markets. But uh, there are such... Uh, a, a number of commonalities here in terms of benefits that the logic really says this is something that ought to be done. So you know, we, uh, I talked about the, you know, the lofty long-term goals, <clears throat> but let's talk about something a little bit closer. This is a fundamentally new mission in space. We haven't had one of those in probably 20 or 30 years, arguably. So this is creating new things to do in space, making the space economy larger. That in itself is an exciting goal. Hi, um, Miriam with Mashable again. Uh, I am just curious, do you uh, envision tourists flying up to the station to stay in the B-330 if it is attached? And uh, if not, there than if there is a free-floating one. I mean, is that where they would go, or are tourists sort of not a part of this? Are you talking more industry? 
so we call them uh, amateur astronauts. Uh, and uh, yes, you, you, we have opportunities for short-term stays because sometimes you don't want to have to, uh, you know, be be away from uh, your your job and your career for months and months at a time. So there are scenarios where it could be a week or two, and there are scenarios where it could be 45 days or 60 days. If, if and this would be applicable to if we're on station, or if it were a free, free flyer, we have more latitude to accommodate those kinds of things. So if we were flying a cargo mission, um, then we could accommodate probably an amateur astronaut or two in where we know that that cargo vessel is going to be turning around and going home quite soon. And, or the, it wouldn't be that one because we rotate the lifeboats, right? So, um, but there's, and there's also different, I think what you might see is a transition where people are able to invent and create uh, their own income streams to compensate for what they've what they've paid uh, uh, for that um, that amateur astronaut experience. So it's not just they you know they, they I think we've seen a precedent on, on the last couple of folks. Any further questions in the red? If not, thank you very much for joining us today. I wanted to let the media in the room know that we have a special thing back there for you. Um, we did a 360 video of one of our launches, and we have a um, cardboard viewer back there, so you can download the app and get the really cool experience of watching the launch in 360. And there's also a flash drive back there with all the information from today for you as well. Thank you.